I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a, and a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. You're listening to a DM podcast. Welcome to The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. As an author, ad man and theologian, I've always been interested in people's stories. Not just those with a high profile, but people from all walks of life, regardless of fame. Which is why I created this show. Each guest who takes the Five of My Life challenge chooses a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. It's amazing what you can learn when discussing someone's five choices. I hope you enjoy listening to the show as much as I enjoy making it. John Colley is a highly regarded and awarded screenwriter whose film scripts include well-known successes as diverse as Master and Commander and Happy Feet. A qualified doctor, he's also a respected journalist and best-selling novelist. A fascinating man who exudes a charming and infectious delight for the world around him, it was a joy to hear him take the Five of My Life challenge. So John, welcome to Five of My Life. Lovely to be here. Now you are a special guest on Five of My Life. Uh, because I think we've had 110 so far, but nobody has been more indecisive than you. <laughs> That's good. You are. I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, no, well, it's not a compliment. You are <laughs> bloody hilarious. I get the email of your choices. I thought, oh, that's great. I'll get, I'll get stuck into those. And then I get the email going, can I change my film? And I go, well, if you must. I think that's all right. I'll let him off. And then I get one going, and can I change my possession? I go, well, I didn't do much research on the possession so yeah okay you can and then i get one he is taking the piss can i change my song and i wrote you going well you can but you can't change your book mate because <laughs> i've already, already read, it. read it and at least it was only 350 pages so you didn't have kind of war and peace to work through is the list the last list this is the, the real last list, list. Oh, we might we might change our mind as we go Nigel but let's see uh, you know, let's start and see where we get to <laughs> okay well listen we start on five my life uh, which is pretty relevant for yourself uh, and one of your amazing professional careers uh, is uh, the film uh, and you've chosen the 1981 cult classic the French film diva yeah. Well, I think my original film was going to be Witness, which is... You can't change now, mate. I'm not going to change it now, but it was... Uh, <laughs> which I thought was an example of, like, structurally and emotionally almost a perfect film. And this film as an art form is could be on the way out, you know. These independent movies that we used to make for 10 or $20 million, the perfectly told sort of 100-minute movie, is now under serious threat both from the Marvel epics at one end and the and the Netflix sort of uh, series at the other end. And so it's becoming quite difficult to fund these things. But anyway, Diva, 1981, by a French filmmaker called Jean-Jacques Benix. Interesting thing about that, this film is that none of the actors will be recognisable stars. Jean-Jacques made one other film called Betty Blue, which was reasonably commercially successful. I and, and love Betty Blue. But he didn't really make anything else after that. And so it's sort of an example of just one of those uh, accidents of fate where everything comes together. And filmmaking is such a kind of, well, it's a thought out process to a large extent. But when you start making it and producing it, there's so many things that can go wrong. And it is really lightning in a bottle making a film that really works like this. I've always believed that film is a vehicle for philosophy, and I know that's one of your great interests. You studied theology and philosophy at university. But I really don't know what this film means. I just know that it's a film that I love to inhabit. 
And it's the story of a young uh, guy in Paris who falls in love with an opera singer who's sort of 20 years older than him. And he goes to her performance and, uh, and illegally records the performance. And one of her things is that she's never uh, made a commercial recording at all. And then he goes to see her kind of post-performance uh, sort of interviews and he steals the dress that she wore. And it gets quite kinky after that because he then takes the blue dress to a prostitute and gets her to put it on and, and to, pretends that she's the kind of the, the opera singer. But this rather crazy love story between this wonderfully innocent, but as I say, innocent but strange young postman, then gets kind of interleaved with a classic sort of French crime uh, thriller, which revolves around another prostitute who's on the rung from a heroin gang, which is all kind of wrapped up with the chief of police. And uh, anyway, it all gets very strange and uh, convoluted. But it is such a work of art, this movie. There's, it's, it's full of arty locations, beautiful, strange moments like a walk around the Luxembourg Gardens, which actually could have been one of my favorite places in the world, to the music of Eric Satie. And it's just, uh, it's just sublime. It's one of these films that is like comfort food that I can go back to again and again and just live inside. So I was fascinated when we, we landed on this particular one, because having done a little bit of research on you and seeing some of your wonderful uh, interviews about the art of screenwriting, it doesn't seem to fit with a uh, cat up tree. It doesn't fit the conventional no, three-act structure I, at all. I, I, but but I, I love the notion of you can love things and not really know why you love them. And not a bit, understand a bit, them. A bit like the latest Bowie film, which is incoherent vomit. But it's brilliant. <laughs> it, you know, Moon Age Daydream, you go, what are you doing, mate? But, but it's great, but you know, I don't know why. So, so would you mind telling our listeners uh, just some of the principles of, of conventionally good screenwriting? So conventionally good screenplay actually the the film about filmmaking that i would recommend is uh, is inception which is about a guy who brings together a team of people and there is effectively a designer um, a director a couple of actors they put together an imaginary he calls it a maze you know but it is a kind of a, it's a it's a world in which you have the impression of agency. You have the impression of being able to make your own decisions, but actually you're being very specifically led to a destination. And getting to that destination involves personal change on the part of the central character. And hopefully along the way you become so in love with, so identified with that central character that when they change, you change. And you start to reflect afterwards on what it was that they did differently that you can apply to your own life. So every film, in my mind, is a little philosophy lesson. And the example that I often use when I'm lecturing about this is The Full Monty, where you have a guy who's gay and hasn't admitted he's gay, who's imp another guy who's impotent and hasn't admitted he's impotent, another guy who's uh, unemployed and hasn't admitted uh, to his wife even that he's unemployed. They all get involved in this ridiculous act of self-exposure and achieve success doing it. And then thematically, that film is about, you know, um, uh, displaying your vulnerability is actually a route to power, a, yeah. a route to fulfillment. You know, actually, don't be afraid of telling people what you can't do, because uh, that self-revelation is basically empowering. And that thematic message is why the film is emotion. Emotion is meaning. That's the real lesson of filmmaking, that, that if if it means something to you. And, it, and the interesting thing about the meaning is that the meaning is, has to be so carefully embedded that you don't quite know what you're learning until you've learned it, and then you think it's your own. And so a really great film will do that to you. It will actually implant a philosophy in your mind that you embrace unconsciously. So I love that because I, I, I think sometimes you can come out of a film, you're emotionally moved, you love it, you tell all your mates, God, that's brilliant, you've got to go and see that. And you don't even know what the lesson is, even though you've learned the lesson. Exactly. Now, I know that sounds like gobbledygook, yeah, yeah. But, but, but you, so, so uh, the way you expressed it in one interview I, I uh, saw of yours, which is, we acquire power by revealing our weakness. Yeah. Now, mate, I've watched The Full Monty and yeah. I liked it, yeah. but if someone asked me... What was it about? What it was about, I, I wouldn't crack out that phrase. Sure. But, but it, it, it's very, 
very accurate and perceptive. Yeah. And, and I, I saw you go through a whole bunch of films doing and what that film means is X. And on every single one, I thought, my God, he's, he's right. And, and the one of the ones, we, we had... Um, we, we had Emil Sherman on, yeah. uh, uh, who, who'd done oh, many, no, sure. many, many films. Exactly. But one of them was The King's Speech. Yeah. And what was the... You, you had yeah, a brilliant... And, and so The King's Speech is in my mind. And, you know, this is a little bit of a party trick in that you can kind of apply the meaning you're, that... you're retrospectively doing you're it. You're retrospectively yeah. uh, yeah. meaning exactly to any film. But The King's Speech is... We, we live in this world which is awash with people telling their own stories and you feel that your own story is going to be drowned out by everybody else's, you know. And the lesson of The King's Speech is that you have to learn to speak quietly and sincerely as if to someone you love. That's what the king learns. You know? I, I just love it. And, and then you did one which is Slumdog Millionaire, yeah. which, which I adore the original book. It was called something else. It wasn't called that, uh, the book, but, but the, 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 the book that the film is of. Yeah, sure. Um, but Slumdog Millionaire, you said, uh, your wealth is your life experience, not your money. Yeah. And Mate, that, you're, you are, you're a genius. But, but, well, it's not, you know, look, it's, it's quite, when you start to analyze films in that way, you can find out what they meant to you. You're, at a certain time in your life and work out the lesson that you needed at that point in life. And, and Slumdog Millionaire came out at the time of the global financial crisis in which we all had to be reassured that all the shitty things that had happened to us in our lives were actually um, were actually our wealth. That's what the Dev Patel story illustrates. You know? so, so, so as an art, here we go. So this is utterly fascinating. But do you, you personally, John, do you create it from scratch uh, or uh, what do you prefer? Or someone comes to you like like I know you're doing Boy Swallows Universe yeah, yeah. now. Do, do you uh, prefer someone saying I've done this thing? You know, it's 900 pages long. Yeah. You mate have got to make it into a uh, you know 90 minute film and give it secret meaning that resonates with people. Do you prefer adapting someone's existing work or creating from scratch? Well, they're they're very similar. So enterprises, because even if you're given, so I'm doing two projects at the minute, one which we just actually wrapped on, Boyce Wallace Universe, this wonderful sort of 500-page uh, Trent Dalton novel, which I did as eight episodes, in, and that's full of different meanings. But, uh, but the one that really leapt out at me was uh, the fact that your life situation doesn't constrain either your imagination or your ability to learn you know and so the, and the guy played in the series by Simon Baker uh, who plays Trent's uh, alcoholic father is is also a bibliophile so this guy living in social housing who's basically you know kind of hope the most hopeless drunk you can imagine violent to his children yeah. and you know, out of it most of the time is actually incredibly well read and you know Trent's life and his book is a testament to the fact that you know you you don't need to be constrained in where you can go in your imagination just because you're living in a certain set of, of circumstances, you know. So that's that one. And, you know, the interesting thing about Trent's book was it's, uh, it's full of wonderful set pieces. And as the person is adapting it, you've got to find the connective tissue because when you're reading a book, you kind of you fill in the gaps yourself. You imagine how we get from A to B. But screenwriting is a slightly different art in that the audience has to follow a chain of events and the and this chain of events has to be so watertight that at no point do they wake up from this dream and go wait a minute how did that happen yeah. you have to answer every question as you go but in a kind of subconscious way the other project that i'm doing for working title is and it's probably really bad timing is uh um is the life of yuri gagarin who was the first man in space of course this is a time in history when it's almost impossible that we'll ever be able to film anything in Russia. So, uh, but you know, that's these things happen. Um, and uh, and with Gagarin, uh, I was given a wonderful book by Stephen Walker, who wrote about Gagarin's first flight. But then you've got to read all about to create a Russian mission control, to create um, just the story of these massive rockets as the weight of a train that they made to fire one guy into space. You have to do so much reading around the subject, and then you load up with all this research. And then you have to distill it into, as you say, like the kind of the kind of what is the story and what is the theme. And sometimes, you know, you don't know what it's about until you've written it or written a draft and then you go, ah, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. But when you get that, when you find out what it's about, when it's thematic when you find out what it's thematically about, that's that's when you can really start refining the story and make it all point in that direction. It just it's in incredible to think of it specifically as a separate art. Do, do you ever meet creators who... So I've written four books. Yeah. Who, who 
other people tell me what they're about. And you go, really? I, I, I just wrote them. No, you, you and, wrote, well, do, do, do you ever meet, you, you know, you're adapting something and you go, I found your theme and the bloke or the woman says, that isn't, that isn't what I was going for. No, no, well, uh, it's actually, if I can tell you about uh, working with Peter Weir, who was uh, the most delightful man when I went to uh, work with him on Martian Commander, I'd uh, made no movies or made one movie and Peter had, had made a, a bunch of fabulous classics and uh, he said, tell me how you write a movie, John, how you, John, write a movie and uh, and we'll do it that way, you know, so... I said, well, I kind of, you know, I sort of, uh, we, get, <laughs> we get these 21 novels and we work out, you know, the sequences that we like. And then we start telling each other the story in a certain order of events. And this, there's these sort of three acts and some people say it's five acts. And, and Peter goes, stop, stop, stop. You know, I don't want to know any of that film theory stuff. That's how you break it, you know. So yeah. in Peter's mind, um, we just start free forming. We play music. We put on silly hats and we act out <laughs> scenes, and and this will magically come together. And lo and behold, it did. Because and you know, I don't know. It's funny. It's like art and science. They both work to the same end in a strange way. You know that you can get to the secrets of kind of quantum mechanics through Hindu philosophy as easily as you can through mathematics that's i look i don't understand how that works but working with peter we did finally i think uh create the perfect kind of uh three act movie you know but in this way where peter would just bounce into the office and go hey i've got this great idea there's this there's a scene in the books where uh, where the sea turns purple and there's an underwater volcano and a, and a whale surfaces <laughs> and i'm kind of <laughs> clutching my head and going well where does that fit yeah no no, no write it write it we'll we'll work it out later <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my word. Well, listen, uh, on the second choice on Five of My Life, I, so I, I love this going to different art forms because you, you colossus, you stride both. Uh, the book is the second um, yeah. uh, choice on Five of My Life. And not only do you make wonderful films, but you write wonderful books, you, you Renaissance man. And you've chosen Graham Greene's 1958 Our Man in Havana. Now, I hadn't read that before, and I don't know why. I sort of thought Graham Greene, oh, God, it's going to be a bit... <sighs> You, you know, yeah. a bit serious. It's hilarious. It's wonderful, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. Hilar- anyway, but, so, but tell us about Our Man in Havana well, and why you, you know, chose it. Interestingly, Graham Greene started off life as a film reviewer and uh, uh, his literary career came out of film reviewing. So he was kind of embedded in, in the whole sort of structural kind of form of movies before he started writing novels. And also he was, I mean, my favorite novelists when I was growing up were all basically writing, they were basically journalists. They were writing about real life experience, Hemingway and Steinbeck and Graham Greene. And there was a form back then of like the perfectly made 350 page novel with kind of, uh, um, with a mixture of thriller elements and love story and humor. And again, you know, Our Man in Havana, when I was a young boy in Edinburgh growing up, spoke to me of this world of exotic Far away places and strange down at heel characters wearing kind of <laughs> crumpled linen suits and the worlds of spying and you know and I guess at that age I missed some of the irony and some of the pathos because the guy Wormold, a fantastically unromantic name, a central character is a vacuum cleaner salesman in Havana who's gone completely broke trying to. Um, kind of give the life that he he's divorced and he's trying to look after his beautiful teenage daughter who the <laughs> chief of police has taken a <laughs> fancy to. <laughs> There's a scene <laughs> where Wormald and the chief of police confront each other and the book is full of laugh out loud humour as you know but, but also as Graham Greene did brilliantly in, in those novels that he called his entertainments um, it's, it's humour which has also got a really deep vein of serious philosophy in it. And, and Wormald says to the chief of police, you're not going to torture me, are you? And the chief of police said, no, Mr. Wormald, you are not a member of the torturable classes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's actually so much awful truth in that statement. You know, and so Graham Greene was, he was, um, uh, I think, a 
fabulous novelist and uh, and and I think his books are really enduring. The dialogue is hilarious. You know, uh, it, yeah. ju- just yeah. sensational. And I lo- love the thing you've just said about how it's funny, but there's clearly real intelligence yeah. and proper points yeah. uh, behind it. I-, I love the art of an under statement sure right yeah. so, so uh, i mean th- th- this podcast is evergreen but hopefully when people listen to it they'll still remember you know megan and harry and all that rubbish but that there's you know i don't know if the queen or someone was asked about one of the the complaints and and just recollection recollections vary yeah brilliant so yeah. the graham green's version of that is it, you know they're talking about i don't know betraying someone or someone sure. being killed or, or are we going to be dealing with russia or america or our yeah. ally is and the bloke says, because Wormald asks, you, you know, are, are we are, are we allies with, you know, Germany, whatever? America, yeah. And he just says, up to a point. Yeah, yeah. And you go, what the bloody hell does that mean? Yeah, you say, everything's negotiable? Well, well up to a point. Yeah, wow. No, and also, you know, like a funny little novel like that takes you back authentically to 1958, did you say it was written? Yeah. So we're 13 years after the end of the war where we still, like the Germans are still people who killed our yeah. brothers and sisters and fathers, you know. The Russians are now this massive threat. This is on the edge of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And um, everyone is, I mean, globally, there was a sense of kind of despair and terror that almost matches the present day. Yeah. And to write, to choose to write a comedy about that period, you know. So the, the, the version that I, um, I, 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 whenever my guest sends me a list, even ones like you that change their choices, yeah, yeah. I don't wait. I immediately go out and buy them. Uh, and Book Depository sent me whatever edition. And yeah. an introduction by Christopher Hitchens. Yeah. Oh, my God, I, I just love his writing. Um, and he was talking about the theme of drink. Yeah, and, and you go, if I hadn't read that, it's a bit like you talking about the summar- summarising a film and it makes sense. Right? You go, every single scene... They're drinking whiskey. It's about drink. Well, here's the other thing about themes in movies and books is that you bring your own preoccupation to the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so Christopher Hitchens was, I guess, was quite a drinker. And there is a lot of drink in it. I mean, yeah. thematically, the story to me is about does your loyalty belong to your nation or to your loved ones? You know, You're and doing it again. No, you no, are no. the world's best summarizer. <laughs> this is fantastic. Do you know Graham Greene? His boss was Kim Philby. In that's real right. life. That's right. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so this is not just some knock around. No, I, mean, exactly. I know he called it an entertainment, but it's a, exactly. I, I'm very grateful that you that you sort of pointed me to it. And and I, I was telling you earlier, um, walking up the stairs, that I've, I've just read Les Miserables, yeah, yeah. Want to get, which is 1,300 pages. Um, this was such an easy read. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I think I did it in two goes. Because no, sure. I, I just you know, wanted it's to carry on. It's very quick. It flies by, uh, and it is a fantastic book. And that thing that you say about authenticity, you know, Graham Greene had worked for MI5. He did know this world. I think that's a characteristic of most of the authors that I really like. They, they're not just riffing. No. It's what I hate about Marvel movies, actually. It's just like assembled assemblies of the best parts from other films you've seen before, and there's no truthful real-life experience in there often. Whereas people like Hemingway and Steinbeck and Graham Greene were writing about a world they really knew, you know? Like of Mice and Men, Steinbeck had been there, you know? And, and for whom the bell tolls, Hemingway had been there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you are a, a brilliant. I, I've been talking to a number of people that know you. Be afraid, be very afraid. Okay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I've got, got this wonderful. Um, everyone, no one would say a bad word about you. Um, uh, you're a very modest chap, uh, which is, hey, that's a very attractive quality. Um, but you've you've written very successful books. You, 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 you I mean, I mean, you, you haven't even mentioned that you're a bloody qualified doctor. Uh, um, talk a little bit about whether you prefer if, if that's not a crass question writing for film or writing books i look at ultimately when i switched from novel writing to film writing it was a commercial decision because it's really very difficult unless you're a multi multi-million selling author it's very difficult to make a living out of uh, books whereas you can make quite a good living out of film writing, even if nobody <laughs> makes your films. You know, so. Oh, you, so you get paid irrespective of whether <laughs> exactly. people go to Westfield to watch so, it. So after my second novel, which is called The Paper Mask, it was the story of a bogus doctor. Um, uh, that got made into a movie. And then and I, I wrote it, I, I adapted it myself in three weeks. My agent said, you can't deliver this now. They'll think it was too easy. You know, so, <laughs> so we waited for a month and then I delivered it. 
Uh, that got made uh, amazingly, and um, and that sort of started me on on that path. And really, you know, now that my kids have grown up, and I don't have school fees to pay, and uh, you know, life gets a little bit uh, less frenetic, uh, it would be nice to go back to novel writing. So you think you've you've got another one, two, three, four? Oh, like, you? like all writers, you know, you kind of you you file away, you know, the sort of the list of ideas that oh. One of these days, I'll write that one. And of course, we will all die with a sort of a filing cabinet full of unexplored and unwritten ideas. But there's a few of them in there. Yeah. Um, total tangent. Are you a fan of the moth? Have you come across the moth? I have. Uh, yeah, it's great, isn't it? So, yeah. so the notion of I, I wish I'd uh, wish I'd learnt this earlier. It's, it's all too late for me now. But just the the just storytelling. Full stop. Storytelling. Storytelling. You got, that's what I have been. Uh, Without knowing it, yeah. I've been pinging back to storytelling, not knowing that that's what sure, I'm doing. Sure, and I think what the what the moth for listeners who don't know the moth, it's it's uh, it's real life individuals who have a tale to tell, you know. And um, what's interesting about that uh, series is that it demonstrates that stories, I truly believe, come from they're born of real life experience, and and we live in an age now where it's possible to be just a filmmaker just a novelist and that becomes your full-time job i think that's quite dangerous because really the best tales come from lived life you know i you know it wasn't a conscious decision to do medicine and then have various adventures as a doctor and then use that as the raw material but that's certainly how my life panned out it's sort of how Jack London's life panned Somerset out Somerset you know, Somerset Morm you know yeah. like Jack London spent three uh, two years of the Klondike Gold Rush, and then spent the rest of his life writing about that intense experience. And even a scientist like Charles Darwin, you know, spent five years on the Beagle and then spent 30 years evolving the theories that came from that. But you need that core of real-life experience, good and bad, in order to, I think, write convincingly and well. And it's, it's a part of the equation that, as I say, in the modern age, it's possible just to go to university, study literature, and then and then be a writer without really having experienced much. So I, I was at a dinner party where I mean, you know, I'm I'm slow to the party where someone was crapping on about Chat GPT, yeah. and it melted my mind. Oh, that they, they, they did it in front of me. Yeah. Right? So so we we made up a, a you know a title whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and made it sort of outlandish, yeah. you, you know, uh, Brazilian prince meets Canadian girl and they get together yeah. and set up a company yeah. and then get married. Yeah. Right? Uh, 80,000 word novel, press enter. Yeah. And it started coming up. Started I mean, there, yeah. literally there. No, no, it's, I, I did that with my daughter the other day. We sat on uh, on the sofa and I told her the first half of this plot I was writing and she put it into chat GPT and it came out with a really good... <laughs> 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 oh, look, it's, it's going to be the next thing we've all got to deal with. Yeah. We're all kind of facing our own redundancy. When I was a young doctor, there was a bloke who, was, who I worked for who was uh, designing computer program to diagnose the cause of abdominal pain in astronauts you know so okay basically or or arctic explorers i've got a abdominal pain is this appendicitis or not and he found out that if the computer asked this rank of kind of 50 questions it could diagnose abdominal pain as well as a surgeon even way back then and this was the sort of 80s you know so to so the version that your daughter and my mate yeah. are are playing around with yeah is is the baby version? That's the baby version. Yeah. You know, in yeah, yeah. five, ten years' time, it will be. It'll be Graham Green. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Well, someone who had uh, who wrote from real life experience. Oh my. God. Gosh, just incredible. The third choice on Five My Life is always the song, and we always add it to the Spotify playlist, yeah. which is a sensation because it's algorithm busting. Yeah, AI right. would never come up with the Five My Life yeah. playlist yeah. because there is no link yeah. apart from the people I get on. Uh, and you have chosen uh, a song from Joni Mitchell's fourth studio album, the Blue Album, yeah. and it's California. California. I'm 
1971. Tell us why you have chosen that you romantic, or, or maybe okay. not. No. So um, can I can I mention my previous? Choices that cut, crossed off the list. Yeah, no, you, no, I think <laughs> we g- won't go g- back. No, no, we given won't. my introduction, I think you must. What, what, what was the previous one? Well, I, what did I have? I had El- there was an Elvis Costello song. Then there was a kind of Steely Dan song. That was it, then, Steely Dan. <laughs> and then there was a really obscure one by uh, uh, Paul Desmond, who was Dave Brubeck's sax player, who is just a genius. And uh, uh, just a shout out for Paul Desmond if you want to listen to the most sublime bebop jazz. Listen to him. But anyway. It's not the 15 of my life. It's not the 15 (laughs) of my life. So Joni Mitchell, uh, my great friend Andy Flockert, who was uh, in my school, went to an old boys school in Edinburgh, George Watson's College, and Andy was this sort of wonderful teenage dope-smoking hippie from a very liberal family. And, you know, the music we grew up with in our early teens, which is the music that you kind of get it somehow gets imprinted on your brain, doesn't it? And that was James Taylor, uh, Elton John, the first Elton John album, uh, Joni Mitchell, Carole King. And these were like, they're kind of perfect albums. And you know, we were talking earlier about the perfect book, but the 40 minute album of music and Joni Mitchell, the album Blue, like everyone is uh, just insane insanely good it's in fact one of the great pleasures of having teenage children growing up is that they'll bounce into the room and go, dad dad have you ever heard of Joni mitchell <laughs> 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 anyway california is this song where she goes through sitting in a park in Paris, france you know then i go to a greek island and i meet this kind of these rogues on the greek islands and then i go to spain and i go to a party down a red brick road that was my escape from Edinburgh when I was a teenager and then when I was a student. Because at medical school, uh, where I went in Edinburgh, you got three-month holidays. You could basically go anywhere. And, and uh, you know, never had any money, but you'd jump on an into inter- rail or just go hitchhiking. And you'd end up in the most extraordinary scrapes and wonderful places. And look, I hope that, tr- that freedom to travel is... St- I know it is because my children are doing it, but... Uh, Oh, God, you know, the kind of just leaving kind of overcast Edinburgh and just heading off with a backpack and, uh, you know, 50 pounds in your pocket. You know, I'll get a job somewhere. You, yeah. know? And you end up drying glasses in, the, in Saint-Tropez in a bar or or uh, or working as, uh, as a lighthouse keeper in the Orkney Islands or pretending to be a tour guide in Greece. You know, all of these strange scrapes and jobs that... I and my friends got into these years of travelling. And that song uh, by Joni Mitchell really evokes that, yeah. I'm wonderful. I'm, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to go down a romantic uh, rabbit hole now because you, you mentioned earlier that all of your favourite um, authors were journalists and you married one. Yeah. <laughs> and this song is is uh, written, she's just broken up with a bloke called Graham Nash. And, yeah. And, and, yeah, yeah, and, Crosby, Stills and Nash. That, that, yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. She, she, gosh, and then James Taylor, so she, just an incredible story. And yeah. that, um, Rolling Stone has it as the third best album ever ever really e- ever made and you go I mean, yeah, all these yeah. lists are stupid yeah, but yeah. hey it's in the top 10 it's fantastic um but but tell us how you met deborah oh deb's and i so um you know life as you know is like a, it's a mixture of planning and accident and after i'd written my uh novel uh a paper mask uh, a friend of mine angela gordon as she was then angela palmer still a great friend had got a job as the editor of the Sunday Times, of the, of the Observer Colour Supplement in London. And Angela rings up and goes, oh, John, you're a writer and you're a doctor. We need a, we need a medical column on the back page of the magazine, you know. So, and I thought, wow, this is a way to combine my job, which is being a doctor, and my great love writing. And I can also travel. Like, so you can go anywhere you like. We'll pay you £500, which was like a fortune per column, you know. As long as it's got a vaguely medical kind of theme, then send in your sort of uh, thousand words and we'll pay you 500 pounds. So this went on for six years. So this is like the trip before the trip. You are Steve Coogan. uh, You you go away and then just write some stuff. Go away, come back with something that is, uh, you know, sort of to to entertain the readers with. So um, 
So then you have license as a doctor to kind of, you know, leaf through the British Medical Journal, find the craziest job <laughs> that you can find. And so this, this one pops out, it goes, doctor required uh, to accompany a plane load of medical supplies to Azerbaijan. Wow, okay. And it was a, it turned out actually to be a kind of like a sweetener for an oil deal. I didn't know that at the time, but I end up sitting in this Illusion aircraft, which is the biggest aircraft in the world, you know, with a, a nose cone that is made of glass. So you can actually sit in the nose cone and look down at the Russian step. And this flies, <laughs> flies me to Azerbaijan, where there's a war going on, where there's actually, there's still a war going on but, right. uh, between Azer Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, so we deliver the medical supplies, and I, as best as I can, tell the Russian doctors what we've brought and what they're all for, you know. And um, my <laughs> fixer, Okte, who turned out to be an ex-army kind of Soviet paratrooper, I said, look, I've, I've never been to a war zone, Okte. What's it like there? And Okte says, well... I'll take you. you know, right. The next thing I know, we're on a Russian military helicopter flying to the front line, and there's these madmen firing howitzers into the darkness, and you know, tracer bullets coming the other way. So, okay, I know what a war is like now. It's all complete madness and pointless. You know, flew back through Moscow, and I had one contact there who uh, Australian readers will remember with great fondness, Robert Hopped. He was a just he was this fabulous Rabelaisian character living in. A wonderful old flat in Moscow, and uh, and Robert said, "What you're just passing through? You've got to stay. This is the hinge of history. This is like everything is happening. You know, Yeltsin has taken over, and uh, and the ruble is in a death spiral, and kind of uh, these capitalist maniacs are moving into Moscow. And it was a very strange and wonderful time. The sort of the." Moscow army generals were selling the samovar and the carpet on the street while kind of uh, prostitutes were making more than the cosmonauts. You know, it was like yeah. the world had turned upside down. And uh, it was there that I met Deb, who was working as a journalist for the ABC, Deb Snow. She and Monica Athard shared a flat and were uh, just, and they had the time of their lives. I, when I first uh, met Deb, I opened the wardrobe in her bedroom in a bulletproof vest fell out and I thought okay this is the girl for me <laughs> 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 my next job that I had fixed up was to go to the Solomon Islands and uh, I was in the Solomon Islands when Deb rang up and said she was pregnant so we, well, well I'm going to stop you there because yeah. that's the perf I didn't know that's where you're going to go your yeah. fourth choice yeah. is the place and yeah. you have chosen uh, Gizo is that Giza. how you pronounce it uh, Giza, Giza sorry, on the Solomon Islands yeah, so, yeah. so maybe continue with that story and this is your fourth choice on Five My Life yeah, uh, sure. Gizo Solomon Islands Gizo and the Solomon Islands so she calls Islands. up and says mate I've got news I've got news and so we met back in London and uh, we went okay let's do it and oh look it wasn't the same. there's a there's a whole story behind all that uh, we actually so we end up we went to counseling actually because we and, and we go to see this counselor at university college hospital in london and uh, we're both in tears going oh look we're kind of 40 and we sort of we just met a year ago and Debs is pregnant and we sort of don't know what to do and the woman who was uh, counseling us said uh, wait a minute you're john cully you write that article in the Observer <laughs> newspaper is so full of wisdom and <laughs> philosophy and <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> what, what are you asking me for? So then I go for a walk on Hampstead Heath with my great friend Michael Wood, who's a historian. He makes the most wonderful history documentaries. And, and um, Michael quoted an Egyptian po poet to me, C.P. Kivafi, who talks about uh, the big yes and the big no. And this this point of your life where you arrive and you go, okay, I'm just going to toddle along doing what I've always done, or I'm going to grasp this decision, which may be a catastrophe or may be fabulous, you know, and that's where you've arrived, you know, and the poem implies that if you say the big no, you will always regret it. If you say the big yes, then of course it may be, you know, it may all go pear-shaped, but, you know, you'll never know. So next thing we know, we're in the Solomon Islands together, and, and uh, it was just the most wonderful time. Lauren, our eldest, was born there. Uh, I, I worked in a hospital that had uh, an English doctor, two English doctors and an Australian doctor and myself, and the most fabulous group of uh, Solomon Island uh, nurses. You know, every day was... I was still actually writing the Observer column then, but, but we had 
kind of crocodile attacks. <laughs> we had kids dying of malaria and we had, like it was, it was challenging, but it was kind of like MASH. You literally saved a life every day, you know, and it was full of terror and joy. Um, I only did it for a year because Deb's by the end of a year, I was sort of having this extraordinary life in the hospital and Deb had a baby to look after and uh, and was missing her job as a journalist. So we came home after a year, but it was a real high point. And that little place on the edge of the Fonavona Lagoon in, uh, in the Solomon Islands will always yeah, be really special. So I was reading up about it and, yeah. and what a place the, the, yeah. the headhunting thing is that oh, true yeah, the, 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 the headhunting was kind of only recently wiped out by the christian missionaries who then discovered retrospectively that it had been the center of a whole series of seasonal kind of rituals that's I mean, what you, we do here that's uh, what we do here and you get rid of the headhunting and it's like taking away the rugby final from <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, like getting rid of the rugby final in Scotland or the food yeah. in Australia. You go, we, like, what are, what are we supposed to do now? You know, like that was... And also the other thing, there's a strange JFK link oh, in, yeah. in, in the Second World War. Yeah, I know. He said the PT-109 was his uh, gunboat that sunk on Kennedy Island where we used to go snorkeling. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was like uh, half a mile in a little boat off the coast. I, I'm just loving your stories. But yeah. We're going to move to your uh, possession on Five My Life. And this is where I'm going to have to out. I'm, and I'm not going to tell you who this is, and it isn't who you might think it is. But uh, I um, was asking people uh, about you. And someone said, uh, it, with enormous affection, but said, he, he, and they sent this to me. It's like, okay. He retains childish, enthusiastic delight for the world around him. Oh, and he has a huge brain. Okay, that's about you. Now, that, that's a lovely thing for someone to say about somebody. But I've written it down uh, underneath the picture <laughs> of you with your possession looking childishly enthusiastic <laughs> underneath your bloody boat, the Steve Zizou. You go, so that guy's quote about you, it seems to be on the money because you look very happy about, you know, either you're painting a boat or something. I've so, got, a, a, like, just for the listeners, I've got a <laughs> tin of anti-foul paint in my hand, you know, which is probably deeply toxic stuff, and I'm painting the bottom of the boat. But you've okay. got a huge, gorgeous smile on your face. It's an 18-foot long boat. I mean, this is, I have to admit, the second choice, because you keep on changing. I think yeah, yeah, the first yeah. one was a bicycle. But uh, yeah. tell us about the... Is Steve Zuzu from the Bill Murray film? Steve Zuzu from the Bill Murray film. Tell us about the boat. Mate. Okay, so the boat is like, it's a long boat, and the long boats are what they have in the islands for getting around and they're they're very fuel efficient and uh, very speedy there's no there's no sort of superstructures no cabin or anything my deb's re, uh, refers to it um as my motorized surfboard because it's basically just a thing for speeding around the harbor but when we bought our house in sydney it was a ramshackle place on uh, in balmain on sydney harbor it was back in the day when you could still buy a waterfront house for less than a king's ransom uh, the great thing about this house is you could park a boat at the bottom uh -huh. of the garden. And when you've got a little speedy flat bottom boat that takes no maintenance, you can swim underneath it and scrape the bottom and, you know, but that gives you access to a Sydney, it's like living in Venice, you know, you can jump on the boat at the bottom of the garden, meet a friend in a cafe for coffee, cruise around all the palazzos, uh, take the kids over. We never had to build a swimming pool you just chuck the kids in the boat and off to the local beach and throw them overboard and um yeah look it has been a it's been a fabulous delight and now as we're all getting older there's a bunch of friends who i pick up three times a week from the wharf in balmain and we all go over to like a bunch of pirates we invade sort of greenwich beach opposite and we pile out and we swim our 20 laps and then we have a coffee and Zoom oh, out again. Right, living yeah. the dream. Yeah, no, it's lovely, and it has been. Uh, well, you know, if you if if you grew up in Europe and you miss skiing and uh, and you're too old and scared to ride a motorbike, then that's the next best thing is to have a have a boat on the harbour. So, so when you were in rainy Edinburgh, yeah, you if I've, someone said to you in fifty years' time you're going to be living in a place on a harbour with a boat whizzing around, you probably wouldn't have. Probably wouldn't have. Believe them. And, and, you know, it's like your life kind of makes itself up as you progress and you sort of, uh, you don't know where and when it's going to end or where it's going to take you. I think probably 
I love Edinburgh dearly and, and miss it still, but I uh, but the it doesn't really have the climate for <laughs> boating and swimming. <laughs> and and I think I've always been drawn to hot climates, partly because, you know, it's much easier to be cheap and cheerful in these places, you know. So in Sydney, yeah, it is an extraordinary, magical city. We were in Venice once with the kids, and my son, uh, Stace, said, uh, oh, I wish we had a palazzo. And my daughter said, well, we kind of do. <laughs> 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 you can jump on the gondola and go anywhere. You can go off to the Lido. Yeah. Um, you talk wonderfully uh, about how films, good films, need to have a transformative moment in it, uh, yeah. usually. So, so, so you're taking the audience on a journey, you, you, you identify with the main protagonist, and then something transformative happens that, that enables the drama to work and there be an ending and whatever else. But that, the same is true uh, in life. Yeah. And I love, the, I, I've forgotten the name of the poet, what was the name of the, the big yes or the big uh, no? C.P. Gavafi. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, just, yeah. just what a wonderful, yeah. wonderful thing. And, and your, your life from Edinburgh to Sydney, from doctor to screenwriter to novelist, and you are such a... Uh, warm engaging lovable character i'm gonna ask one dark question before my uh, closing question sure um uh, any regrets you know i'm prepared for this one because i listened to your charlie teo interview yeah that, that he, he gave a great answer didn't he i thought a rather wriggly answer actually oh, <laughs> you know, well, what, what, if you're a, if you're a controversial uh, brain what, surgeon you know, someone what, says what that, that, that what do you regret so your regrets i have, of course we've all got regrets and i look i've been reading bridget delaney's uh book on stoicism which i think is a wonderful book which i recommend to all your listeners and the stoics according to bridget believed that uh you Focus your life on the things that you can change. And so the past is the past, you know, whatever you did then. I mean, my, I, I would say my biggest regret was never finding a way of incorporating medicine and writing and, and carrying on doing both. Uh, my brother, George, who we're seeing this summer, once uh, joked that I was trying to live three lives simultaneously, and there's some truth in that. And, you know, it is a regret because I had, got such joy and such a sense of social worth from being a doctor and uh, but the truth is that if you're just doing it part-time you very quickly um, lose the kind of snappy front of mind reflexes that you need to make decisions in crises and so I kind of I retired myself very young at the age of you know just after in fact came back from the Solomon Islands work for six months in the in the Royal Free Hospital doing pretty kind of cutting edge obs and gynae and thought at the end of that six months, you know, these young, newly trained doctors are so much faster and smarter than I am. I, I was used to women who come in off a canoe and uh, pop out their fifth baby and say thanks very much and go home. And this was highly interventional medicine, a lot of cesareans, a lot of inductions, you know, there's a whole philosophical question there about whether medicine has become too technologized. But anyway, I I realized that that was a foreign territory for me, you know. So after, so I, I sort of then focused entirely on the writing. And, and but it would have been lovely to still be able to contribute that way because certainly when you go to a third world country, there's such a need and uh, there's not many of us could, who have those skills, you know, so, yeah, uh, that is a regret. But, you know, it's just, it's, it's hard to include everything in your life, being a writer, being a dad, make, paying the bills, and doing all the things that you love. Thank you for taking that question uh, on squarely. Sixth question, who yeah. would you like to hear on Five My Life next, and why? Uh, look, I think you're podcast because I've been listening to them and, and loving all of the oh, interviews but because you. of the, the books that you write you know you skew towards I guess old farts like me and I would love to hear from some young farts you know right and my friend Bill Lambach who I'll introduce you to his two sons have a band called Lime Cordial which has just done phenomenally well in the last few years and so I think you should interview them about what it's like to become a pop star
you can reflect going forward, and you can reflect on your on your present. Of so, course, so you know, I, yeah. I am with you. Yeah, yeah. That. Look, you interview Mozart at the age of twenty-two, and you know he's already done. That's right. You to tell us about the symphony you wrote when you were eight. Joan of Arc, when you were 17 and exactly. you were saving Orléans. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been to these graveyards in India where, you know, you see the kind of the, the, the gravestones of old um, administrators of the empire, you know, died of malaria age 33, having become the, yes. kind of the governor of uh, Mysore, you know, whatever. So Alexander the Great, he, yeah. he ascended to the throne, if it was a throne, at 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Colley, you are a dead set legend, mate. I like the childish, enthusiastic delight for the world. You have been a delight. Thank you so much for sharing your five on five of my life. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you follow Five of My Life, you might enjoy my latest book, Smart, Stupid and Sixty. In it, I write about a number of the issues discussed on the show. It's the 20 year follow on from my first book, Fat, Forty and Fired. If you have any feedback on the book or suggestions for the show, please get in touch via my website, nigelmarsh.com.